Welcome to the con! This is a show dedicated to helping singers, songwriters, and indie artists like you create leverage in the music business. Leverage is a strategic advantage. It's the power to act effectively. It means you're coming to the table with a reputation with real business as opposed to having your hat in your hand and hoping that they're going to see your potential the way you see your potential. That's why we called it The Climb, C-L-I-M-B, Creating Leverage in the Music Business, and that's what you're going to need to be successful in the new music industry. It's what you're going to need to get the manager, to get the deal, to get the pub deal, to work with the other artists, to work with the better songwriters. This You're going to have to have, you're going to have, to have something going on, and uh, we want to help you with that. So the C-L-I-M-B, that amazing acronym, is brought to you by Word Boy, my good friend, my mm. friend and uh, co-host, Mr. Brent Baxter. <laughs> Friends, an award-winning hit songwriter with cuts by Alan Jackson, Randy Travis, Lady Antebellum, Joe Nichols, and more. And what I love about Brent is he helps songwriters like you turn pro by revealing how you write like a pro, how to do business like a pro, and then he'll actually give you multiple opportunities over the course of a year to connect you with the pros. Can't do any better than that. You can find Brent super easy at uh, songwritingpro.com. That's easy, easy for to, you say. to say. Yeah. <laughs> so again, songwritingpro.com. And I would like to introduce you to my co-host, Johnny Dwinell. Johnny owns Daredevil Production. They help you find your sound and they help you grow your audience so you can become the artist that everybody loves so you can get paid. Daredevil has worked with multi-platinum artists such as Colin Ray, Tracy Lawrence, Ty Herndon, and Andy Griggs, just to name a few. You can find Johnny at DaredevilProduction.com. That's production, singular, with no S, and there's no S because there is no other. Johnny D. What's going on, brother? Man, I'm excited to get to share a little something I, I haven't shared. I know. Like we're, we're getting a little, do a little something different. Pull this back week. the curtain on, exactly. on the uh, the Freddy of Oz, the, yeah, exactly. the Oz of Freddy. The <laughs> Pay much more attention to the man behind the curtain, please. Yes, <laughs> that's right. So we got a cool interview yes. that we're going to share with, um, with with Chris Lindsay. Chris Lindsay. Yeah. Yeah. So massive hit song. Right oh, now. yeah. I mean, if you've heard of a little song called "Amazed." Possibly, maybe I'm amazed. Maybe a Lone Star hit the size of the state of Texas. Yeah. Yes. Lord. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, the story is on this. Um, you know, I have a, a songwriter community called Freddie, uh-huh. and we do these called Know the Row events okay. and get to know people. You know, the music row professionals. And so, I've had you know, hit songwriter Byron Hill on there, hit songwriter Jimmy Yeary, music publisher Scott Shared. I've had other folks on there, artists like Aaron Goodwin and. And other folks, and so we do this regular for for people that are subscribers to Freddie. And so anyway, I talked to Chris. Chris has a great podcast called The Pitch List, which I'm a fan of. I subscribe, and it's it's a great songwriter podcast. And so I, I don't know, I didn't know Chris personally, but I reached out to him. I was like, hey, you got a podcast? I got a podcast. Why don't we do some of this Freddie community thing here, and I'll let people know about it. So part of what I wanted to do with this, normally these are only for Freddie members. But uh, Chris and I decided, hey, let's make this first 30 minutes of this hour-long event open to the public. Okay. So we, we invited other people in outside the Freddie community, and then all the Freddie people could show up for free with, you know, with their membership as well. And, and then uh, we decided, let's go ahead and make a podcast out of this as well. So what we're going to hear today is the first uh, about 30 minutes of that interview I did as part of the Know the Row event with Chris Lindsay. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Chris, of course, he wrote Amaze, which is one of his first you know, cuts. Which is a good really? way to start off there. Yeah, it, it was early in his career. <laughs> yeah. Steps of the first swing at bat, ladies and gentlemen. Grand slam, League, and it's a grand slam. Yeah, <laughs> it's as good as it gets. Not not too shabby. <laughs> uh, so that was like '99, I think, and that song just you know killed. Also, one thing cool, uh, Lone Star, the follow up called Smile, it topped like the Amaze was at the top of the Billboard Hot 100, and then Smile, which he, Lindsay also wrote reached number one on the Billboard Country Chart, which is the first time a country group held the number one singles on both charts in the same week, the Hot 100 and the Country Singles. Oh, wow. Two different charts, number one the same week, and he wrote both of them. So he did all right there. Uh, because he, because that darn amazed crossed over. She, oh, it did. And it was she, on every other day station, yeah. not just country. You just, you probably, yeah. Some of you are cringing because you're still sick of that song. Yeah. <laughs> but tough. It, you know? He's like, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, he co-wrote the Martine McBride hit. This one's for the girls, uh, which reached like number three on the Billboard Country chart and spent nine weeks at number one on the AC chart. So this guy's crossing over and doing stuff. Yeah. He was all. He's also a producer. He produced the uh, 
Radio and Records most played country song of 2003, 19 something, recorded by Mark Wills. It was 1970 something. Yeah. That one, yeah. he produced that one. So he's a hit producer as well. He's uh, produced other stuff. He's also had cuts like, uh, oh gosh, Carrie Underwood, uh, Tim McGraw, uh, Keith Urban, Dang. people you might have heard of. Oh, and just recently, he had the number one single with Blake Shelton. Every time I hear that song. Oh wow! And that song's like six years old. I found out. Really? So yeah, that which yeah took a while to get. It took cut. a while. Interesting. Yeah, worth the wait. So, but wait before we get into that. Yes. Let's take care of a little bit of business. All that stuff too. I'm so excited about the interview. That's yes. right. So uh, first and foremost, we want to give a shout out to uh, to Disc Makers, our partner on this podcast mm-hmm. here. Uh, we're proud to partner with Disc Makers. We've been, they've been supporting indie musicians before indie music was even a thing. And whenever y'all are ready to do CDs or DVDs or create some vinyl, distribute music and videos with the customized USBs. You want to go to discmakers.com. It's D I S C M A K E R S.com. It's the only place you need to go. Mm-hmm. And while you're there, click on the guides and resources tab and download some of their excellent free guides. They've just revised and expanded their home studio handbook, which has a ton of great information and advice for newbies and studio veterans. You can find them online at www.discmakers.com or give them a call at 800 468 9353. 800-468-9353. Cool. And hey, uh, join the client community. If you haven't done it yet, that's on Facebook. We mm-hmm. let everybody in who requests to be in as long as you have something more than a silhouette for your profile mm-hmm. picture. Um, and be good boys and girls or you will be Roadhouse. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's some good stuff going on there. Yeah. Lots of people helping other people out. they got opinions, man. We had we just uh, recently interviewed uh, Jeremy Brook, uh-huh. uh, music attorney, and we took all the questions for him to answer from the climb community. We just right. put up a graphic. Hey, what do you want to know? And there it is. It's free. I mean, what a great resource. Other uh-huh. songwriters, other indie artists are all trying to do the same thing and, and uh, everybody's helping everybody out there. Uh, subscribe to the podcast so that all the episodes and minisodes come right into your phone and you can consume them how you like. Leave a five-star rating review. It lets other people know who are thinking about thinking about us right? <laughs> yeah. uh, that we're legit and then man the best compliment that you could give Brent and I would be to share it let, let somebody else know hey man this is a killer podcast I'm getting a lot of value out of this you should listen to it too I know you got this issue or that issue that's been on your mind and I think you're going to get some answers mm-hmm. here and at least get you in the, in the, in the right headspace. so that said uh, what happens next uh- well, subscribe. Did we say subscribe? We did. We did. I got all. I got uh, through all that. Okay. Wow. It all comes so fast. John. <laughs> you hear? I don't remember doing. It. I blacked out like Will. You hear like 140. That's how you do it. That's how you debate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard this 143 times. So it all it starts to blur just System a little bit. Two. I'll be honest. System two. System two. Yeah. Right. So all right. So let's go into the uh, into the audio for the interview, and then we'll come back. We'll circle we'll, back around when it's done, and we'll say how do you went so. So here is Chris Lindsay. Please welcome hit songwriter, Chris Lindsay. Hello, hey, Chris. Well, how are y'all doing? The, the, I'm sure they're nodding and saying they're doing well, but they've all muted themselves. <laughs> yeah, them to... I, yeah, yeah. No, I can see. I see people popping up as they uh, log on, so that's great. Uh, excellent, yes. So, um, Chris, now, my goal for tonight is to help these writers watching live and then the ones watching the replay in the future, basically to help them get where they want to go to help them grow in their songwriting journey and basically to help them turn pro if that's what they want to do. Um, So over the next hour, I want to tease out some of the lessons from your success as a songwriter and from your perspective as, as a hit songwriter and your time that you've had in the business. And then we'll open it up to questions from the community, but I'll, I'll pepper you with the first couple questions. Sound good? Absolutely. All right, man. All right. All right, we'll dive on in there. Um, now, I was doing some research on you because we actually haven't met until today. That's right. Um, but I understand that Amazed was one of your first songwriting credits. It was one of your first cuts. Is that correct? Or is the internet lying to me? No, no, it's true. Um, Amazed was the first single that I had. Nowhere and, to go but level off after that, right? Um, yeah, and probably still the biggest song I was ever a part of. Um, mm-hmm. I had had a couple. I'm trying to think if I get it straight. Um, I'd had a couple small, I had a, a guy named Joe Diffie. Yeah. Um, a, a album cut for him. I think it was called uh, Houston, We Have a Problem. We had a funny song. And mm-hmm. then um, there was a band called Sons of the Desert. And I had a single on them called Albuquerque that died a hideous death right at the same time as Amaze. But Amaze mm-hmm. was really the first single I ever had. 
Excellent. Well, um, second off of that record. Okay, great. Now, I think a lot of writers, I, I kind of have a similar story. For me, Monday Morning Church with Alan Jackson was my was oh, yeah. my first major cut, period. And it also was my first single and my biggest song to date. I, I think a lot of writers, when whether they're in town grinding away or whether they're out of town and, and trying to get to Nashville or whatever their major music city is, they think, man, if I have that song, you know, that first, I can kind of have that first blow of success, like right. Monday Morning Church or like Amaze, which was you know huge. And that'll kind of solve everything. But you've lived through that. Yeah. How was, how was that experience for you starting off and, and really, obviously you've been writing for a while, but like how long have you been writing before that and how did that change things for you? Yeah, well, it definitely was not, uh, an, I was not an overnight success. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I moved here, I was probably here in my fourth year when Amazed came out. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, I'd been three years with a publishing deal with a small company called uh, API. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be honest, um, it was a difficult experience. I really, um, I came here from, I, I was raised in Texas. Uh, out of college, I went to LA and lived there for five years. I met uh, this guy, Johnny Slate, who ran API and produced uh, Joe Diffie. And then he discovered and produced Tim McGraw. Well, actually managed Tim. Um, he offered me a deal when we were in Cal when I met him in California. He said, "If you'll move to Nashville, I'll give you a publishing deal." I'd given him a few songs that he liked. Mm -hmm. So then I moved from LA to Nashville, get settled, rented a, an apartment, take a meeting with Johnny. At which point, he tells me that he can't sign me. He doesn't have the money, which he did, but he said he couldn't. So I had moved all the way across the country for this job, and it wasn't there. But he said, you know, you can write with my guys and blah, blah, blah. So I did. And then uh, about eight months into that, I had a song that went on hold for Randy Travis. And then he came back and was like, why didn't we ever do that publishing deal? And I was like, I don't know, Johnny. <laughs> so as soon as I had something that he thought was going to get cut, he went ahead and signed me. You know what? Johnny Slate gave me my break and I love him. He's passed now, but... Mm. He, he was a little bit of a snake oil guy, you know, he was old school, a uh, little, but he was also a brilliant songwriter in his day and a great uh, businessman. And uh, so I wrote for him for three years. I'm trying to condense this, but I think it's important for newer writers to hear these kind of stories. At the end of my third year of writing professionally, um, and it was, believe me, it was a low draw thing. I was working construction on the side. Um, uh, at the end of the three years, I was actually in worse shape than when I moved to Nashville. You know, I sort of devolved. You know, I, I don't know if you had a similar experience. I had some good songs that I thought were good when I got here, and Johnny liked the, the gist of them. But after three years of trying to do this and work with his guys who were very bone country guys like Kerry Kirk Phillips. Oh, yeah. One of the guys, Andy Spooner, Howard Purdue. They wrote a lot of the Diffie stuff. And you know what? To be honest, they took me out of their wing, and I learned how to write country music from them. And I was a rock guy. I was not a country guy. And mm -hmm. I learned a ton from them. But it wasn't really my bag. And at the end of the three years, I felt like I was going to have to go home. I did, I did not think it was going to work. And the, I tell the story because I think it's important. So at the end of year three, or coming up, my, I'm figuring, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm not making the publishing company any money. They're probably going to drop me. Out of desperation, I... Uh, out of desperation, I wrote a song called uh, A Place in the Sun, which was a complete, like a Beatles song. Mm -hmm. It's something that I loved, you know? Because after, I, I had gotten so frustrated with trying to write quote-unquote country music, um, I finally just broke down one day and wrote with one of the pluggers and did this song called A Place in the Sun, which they didn't like. Mm -hmm. uh, Three or four months later, a guy, Mark Hall, whose dad, Rick Hall, owned Fame, was friends with that plugger and said, hey, man, y'all need to demo that song. We snuck it on without permission onto a session. Yeah. Because the publisher wouldn't pay for it, but we did it anyway. <laughs> Long story short, two weeks later, uh, there was a huge fight with Tim McGraw and uh, Dina Carter about who was going to record it. And that kind of got me going. And then in the next year, we wrote Amazed. But um, I'd say I probably came this close to packing up and going, you know. Yeah. I always like to tell that story because I think it's important for people to hang on, you know. 
hang on, get better, and you never know where it's going to come from. But if you put in the time and if you keep writing and keep getting better, you know, and improving your, uh, you know, if it's not working, do something different. You know what I mean? Different mm -hmm. co-writers, uh, anything. Just mix it up until you hit a combination that does work. And I'll tell you one thing I did learn, learn from Johnny. Uh, Johnny always used to say, however honest you can be with yourself about your material is how, is how good you can be. Mm. If you, otherwise, another way of saying it is, if you can't be brutally honest about your songs, you can't get any better. That's how far you can go. When you, when you think that that song is, uh, you know, that's it, you, you don't grow anymore. So I think the, probably one of the key skills to doing this is being able to really honestly evaluate yourself, you know, and where you are and where your songs are and where they need to be improved. Yeah, I think that's a great, I've heard a quote, I can't remember the, the writer that said, it wasn't, I don't think it was a songwriter, but it said a writer is most unfair to himself when he is unable to be hard on himself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because um, I would say for everybody listening, just be, be vicious with your material, man. Every little thing that you think, if you, when you listen to your song, when it's completed, your little, uh, your little muse, your little inside voice, when, it, when you listen to it down, there'll be little places and you'll have little, and you'll go, I don't know about that. And you'll have little justifications why that's okay, but it's not okay. Mm -hmm. Those, pay attention to those feelings. And I'll tell you another good trick. You can get a song that you've written to the point to where you think it's right, it's good, every word is in the right place, there is nothing wrong with this song. Then go play it for somebody who has a decent set of ears and listen to it with them in the room, sitting beside you, and then you'll get a whole other set of uh, feelings about that song when you let someone who you know really knows songs, um, that'll give you another level of critique that'll enter into your being. You, mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, I know exactly what you're saying. I've had the same experience where right. those little, that little voice that you can kind of gloss over or right. explain away. Uh, unfortunately, I had the higher level of critique while I was sitting in a publisher's office trying to that's what, you know, no, that's where around. I, no, that's where, I, that's where I learned this. It's like mm -hmm. I had a song that I thought was a hit. Tim McGraw will cut this. And I run down and because I, you know, we got to, after we had a couple of hits, it was easier to get in to see people. Mm -hmm. I ran down with this song and played it for Missy Gallimore. Well, when I'm listening with her, same thing I'm sure happened to you. I'm listening with her and I'm like, well, shit, he can't do this. <laughs> that's not, that's, he doesn't do this thing or he's not going to say that. And I'm like, oh, shit, what am I doing? You know, right. so if you get that other person in the room, I, this is the way I look at it. Um, my wife, Amy, and I both sort of figured, well, and I'm pretty sure you figured out too it's almost impossible to truly critique your own material. Mm -hmm. uh, the simple fact is you wouldn't have done it if you don't like it. You know, if you, whatever your sensibility is, that's in the song and the highest execution level of that is still going to be what you love. So just by design, you're never going to be a good judge of whether or not that's a hit song right. because it was crafted to please you. Mm-hmm. Now, and I think that's what you should do. You just have to rely on outside people to say that was a great one, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Those little things I glossed over as soon as I was sitting at that desk across from a publisher, hoping to get noticed. Right. All of a sudden those little things got really, really big. So I, I, I like, I, I like your twist on it, which is a safer twist of finding someone whose ears you respect. Right. And then it'll give you that same sense of that, you know, your, your meter gets a lot more uh, sensitive to those little that's, bumps and those little things and you, you can't ignore them anymore. So that's a yeah. good, safe place to do that versus a public yeah, office or an A&R office. That's a better way to say it. Your, your, uh, your BS meter gets more sensitive. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it doesn't have to be an A&R person. There's probably, I'm sure everyone listening has writing partners or people in their lives, you know, that, that are song people, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's a good trick. Yeah, I think that's great. That's something I, I've used, but I don't think I've shared that with people. So, uh, no, that's awesome. Uh, so after, after Maze Tate, you mentioned that it got e easier to see people. My yep. experience was i have been in town about two years when I had my first hit. And I didn't get to skip all those other steps. That was kind of like unattached from the rest of my life and career. It helped me get a publishing deal. You know, got right. me in, in some rooms. 
but I still had to kind of go through all those steps and mature as a rider because overall I wasn't ready yet to be doing that consistently. Right. Uh, what was your, cause, and kind of going through the, back to the mindset of new rider thinking, if I can just pop that one out, I got, I got the song. I got the one song I'm riding through town with it. If I can get this on the right desk, boom, I got a career. Well, I, yeah, I've never seen that happen. I haven't either. No, I know where you're going with that. And I don't want to discourage, but I saw, I'll tell you what I did see happen a couple times. Mm -hmm. And one of them happened in my API days. A guy came into town and I don't remember this guy's name. He's a nice guy, but he was from Texas. Johnny had found him. He had one song that Johnny wanted to cut on Joe and Mm -hmm. it was a hit. Mm -hmm. And he, he walked in, you know, fresh off the boat with that song. Well, here's what happened. Um, he walked into town with a number one record. Mm-hmm. Now, you and I, the first day we got here, started getting our butts kicked. Right. You know I mean, you, you know, you know that thing when you first move here, it's like, get in line, buddy. You oh, know? yeah. You know, there's two, there's, you know, whatever, there's 5,000 of us. Go start playing Riders Nights, find mm-hmm. you some co-riders and get in line. This ain't right. going to happen. Nobody sent for you, son. Right, okay. exactly. There's a lot of ways they say that, but <laughs> yeah. so this guy came in with a hit. Well, here, here's what happened because I watched the whole thing. After he had that number one, of course, he thinks he's got it figured out, right? Yeah. But he didn't spend two years here like you did, getting your ass kicked, mm-hmm. making you dig down and learn and study and, you know, cry at night about how you're not going to make it. And that is very motivating, but it also makes you better, you know? So he didn't have any of that. So he thought he had it figured. You couldn't tell him anything. So when he was co-writing, he's like, well, when I wrote my number one song, this is what I did. And, of course, he's writing with people that have multiple number ones. And, you know, it didn't work for him. Basically, Mm -hmm. three years later, he was gone. And I've always thought about him. And the lesson there is that he didn't have three years of college like we did. Right. So when it when people turned to him and said, "Okay, great, you wrote this hit song. What you got? What else you got?" He would hand it to him, and they're like, mm, "That's not a hit. But where's the hit?" You know. And then when he turned to other writers to co-write with, he was just sure that he knew what he was doing, and he was not a good collaborator. Mm-hmm. He didn't learn. You know. So there there is a learning curve here, and no matter how much this town beats you up, if you can take a beating, you'll come out of it good. Right. Yeah. And I think the, the lesson there is, you know, one hit doesn't make a career. No, it certainly didn't for me. It, it helped me get on the radar of major Bob music to sign my first publishing deal. They're like, okay, we know you can write a hit cause you, you just did. Yeah. It's uh, not, a, it's but, not a small thing to write a hit. Now I will say, right. It's uh, to be involved in a hit song is a pretty rare experience. So, mm-hmm. but, but I, I can, I think it's true that it, it doesn't make a career, but I'll tell you something else. I don't know that 10 hits makes a career either. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I, I guess it does. I guess it does. I mean, but but here's the thing, man. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't get any easier, I guess. I mean, I don't want, like I said, I don't want to bum people out because I love what I do and I've done it for 20 plus years. Mm-hmm. And I haven't slowed up yet and I, I still love it. I love going to work every day, but it never gets easier. It's always the same thing. It's like, it's like being a professional athlete. Mm-hmm. It's like you can have a handful of Super Bowl rings, right? Mm-hmm. But you've got to play this game, right? Right. You got to win this game. No one came to see you talk about your Super Bowl wins. They want to see you win today. That's right. Yeah, and um, it's just showing up every day. I mean, you better love the process. If you think you just oh, have yeah. one or two songs, and that's gonna, and I'll just go in and I'll roll in, I'll get some hits, then I'll then I'll roll back out. If you don't right. love the process, you're not going to stick it out, and it's not going to work. No, but I mean, if you have a couple songs, you can make you know what they used to call a pretty good lick. You know, you can make some money. <laughs> uh, well, two things. I mean, it's rare to find somebody around here that does this for the money. Mm-hmm. And number two, myself and probably everyone, I, and I know you'd be this way too, we get pretty suspicious about somebody doing this for the money because it's just too hard. Right. If you just want to make money, there's easier businesses. I'm not saying other businesses are necessarily easier, but some of them are. I mean, right. the amount of work, blood, sweat, and tears that goes into this applied to almost any other vocation you'll make more money, even if you have multiple hits. Mm. Yeah, when you average that out. When you, exactly. <laughs> right, yeah. Right, you know, if you started a construction company here or air conditioning or plumbing, 
you put that kind of dedication into it, you might end up with more net worth than having five hit songs. Mm. So it's not about money. Right. Um, and so you mentioned you've been doing this for like 25 years. You've written, obviously, a ton of songs during that time because you, you show up and you work. So at this point, what makes you want to write a certain idea? Like, what are some of the reasons you might pass on an idea versus going, okay, yeah, that's the one I want to write today? What are some of those things that go into that, that thought process and, well, and choosing? Yeah, if I'm in a session with, say, it's a newer writer um, and they have a record deal and they're writing, they're trying to write their first record and they come in, um, uh, that's not a good example because, you, as you know, when you work with artists, you really – are really trying to assist them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Say a young writer who's a pure writer comes in, is really great, and you're interested in that person. Um, I will reject an idea. Well, there's a couple things. One, if, if it's, you know, 50% of the time, I'll have messed with that idea before. I rarely hear an idea that I haven't already written something damn close, or I'd say 20% of the time, they'll pitch a title, and I'd say I already wrote that. And then 50% of the time, maybe 75% of the time, they'll pitch a title that I, either I wrote or somebody I know wrote. Um, so they'll get rejected right out like that. Not to say that you can't recycle because there's been several hit songs this year that were hits in country 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. so I don't, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter. But uh, there's two things. If I've written it before, I don't want to mess with it. And if I... If, okay, I, I can tell you, if there's no service in that idea, I might shy away from it. And what I mean by service is, you know, as a songwriter, ultimately, you're trying to add value to people's lives, right? Mm -hmm. The song works and gets cut and gets on the radio. What you're trying to do, I, what you should be trying to do, in my humble opinion, is add value. So if you do a song about loss, you are trying to validate and comfort people who have experienced loss. If you do a love song, you're trying to validate and celebrate people who are in love. You know, mm -hmm. like if you, you know, if you look at, Oprah, like look at Oprah. So she did all those TV shows and she made a I mean, she became one of the most successful people in the world. Oprah, as far as I can tell, went to work every day saying, what idea for this show today would help the most people? Mm -hmm. so, all my, Tony Robbins, who I really follow and, and love, yeah. uh, says this. If you go drive through a rich neighborhood, whoever has the biggest, nicest house helps the most people. Mm -hmm. and it's sort of counterintuitive because you might want to think that this super rich person just got lucky or they're, you know, somehow – some greasy way they're making money. Right, but takes advantage it, of the most people. Right. Uh, right. Typically, pe songs that work do, do work. They do something for people. So if I have an idea that I don't think has good intention, you know, or is selfish about wallowing around in your own pain and misery that no one would be interested in, I'll reject that kind of idea too. Oh, and there's a third category, which is just this type of idea that, that I've learned over the years, I'm not good at that. I could say, you know, you know, there's guys that get that all over the radio, but I'm not going to be the right guy because I don't like that kind of stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, and then you know, that's that's usually why I reject things if I do. Yeah. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty picky. Mm -hmm. I'm well, pretty I think that's a great concept of because I've said it before a bunch that we're in the service business. Yes, we are. You know, as songwriters, we want to serve the artist. And the artist, if they're wise, they want to serve their listener and they want to serve their audience. Right. So if we can think right. about bridging those gaps, ultimately what's going to serve the listener, if we serve the listener, then therefore we're helping the artist serve the listener as yeah. well. And I think that's a great way to think about it. What is going to serve them? What's the value in this song for, you know, my, and there's a wide range of that. It could be anything from, well, it's going to make them dance. Sure. And or yeah. it's going to make them pick up the phone and to. call their mama. Right. It does not have to be like this heavy stuff, life and death. And it could be just, I mean, there's a tremendous value in someone working a really hard job, driving and stuck in traffic for 30 minutes at six o'clock on the way home and turn on the radio and hear something fun. You mm -hmm. know, there, that's a lot of value. 
Oh, yeah. So it doesn't have to be necessarily heavy. I think the interesting part is that it's counterintuitive. You can make the most money by basically doing, being the most, being of service, serving. That's what you're doing, you know? Yeah, I think when, when you walk into, well, like you were talking about writing with the artist, we're there to serve that artist. We're help, there to help them yeah. tell their story, connect with their audience, connect with their story, that sort of thing. But also when you walk into, I think, to a publisher's office, you know, if you're shopping around, trying to get noticed, trying to get a deal, it's about how can I serve you? What can I bring you? Right. That's going to help yeah. you solve your problems. You have your own problems. You're not too worried about mine. Right. You're hoping and I'm going to come in serve, and serve you and help you with your problems. Exactly. And one thing I learned when um, I had some pretty good run of cuts and hits and I wanted to produce because I always loved working in the studio. So I started producing and having some success. So as I was working on records as a producer, of course, there's a lot of pitch meetings. So I mm-hmm. switched chairs from being the guy pitching the song to being pitched too. And that mm-hmm. really taught me a lot. And one thing it taught me is songwriters tend to be very precious with their songs in the sense of that's their baby. And I get that. My wife tells me all the time, you take this too personal. I'm like, yeah, it is personal. It's my song. It doesn't get any more personal than that. <laughs> but at the same time, if, if I go pitch to a producer who's cutting Florida Georgia Line, right? Mm-hmm. They've cut most of this record. And they got one slot they're trying to fill. And for whatever reason, they've cut a bunch of tempo and they need a love song which would be weird, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but say they did. <clears throat> now, I've just had this killer song that I just demoed that's a hit, and it's legitimately a hit. It's mm-hmm. a real hit, but it's a tempo. Now, I'm like, I got a hit song for you. And he goes, man, somebody will cut that. That's awesome. I need a love song. Now, if I get mad at him because he doesn't want my hit song, mm-hmm. I can't do that. I have to go, okay, stop. He wants a love song. I need to go back into the vault. It's like selling shoes. Mm-hmm. You go out there and the, the girl goes, I'm looking for some red shoes for the, to match this dress. You don't go, no, you're going to buy these brown shoes or that's it, by God. Right. You go back and go get the red shoes you've got and you hand right. them to them. And you're like, what size are you? No, I don't care if you're seven. These are nines. You'll like them and they'll, you'll grow into them. It's so, do something uh, with it. Yeah, songwriters <laughs> tend to hang on to their stuff so tightly and take everything so personal. It's intensely personal, but you need to keep that in the writer's room. When, when you've got it demoed, you've got to put a, another hat on, which is the business person hat, you mm-hmm. know? And then, then it's sales. It's like selling anything, you know? And, and it matters, you know, how you sell yourself and how you sell your songs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I've probably talked enough about that. All right. So after that, uh, that was into the, the, I guess, the audio that we did that night. But then we opened it up to questions from the people that showed up. And if you want to hear the whole thing, you can, uh, it's for exclusively in the members area, freddy.com. That's F R E T T I E.com for our subscribers. And, and you can get the, all the back episodes of Know the Row and, and also all the future ones there for members. And, and depending on when you're listening to this, Freddie might have become songwritingpro.com at that point. So I'm going to be a little bit Are you that close of, to it? I hope so. <laughs> and that these are going to live forever. So most of the time it's going to be Songwriting Pro, not Freddie. What Freddy. is that, a tech thing? It's a tech thing, yeah. I'm just, I have too many brands. I'm trying to simplify my branding. That's and a high so class problem. It is, it is a high class problem. How many friends problem. you got that got too many brands? I guess I got all brands. I got <laughs> brand, my brands got brands. <laughs> I'm not changing the climb. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so hopefully uh, it's Freddie, F R E T T I E, right now. And in the future, be Songwriting Pro. And that'll just be like the membership component of Songwriting Pro. Still do the blogging and, and of course, the podcasting. So, a ton of free resources. But yeah, so it's just a cool thing. We Next one I have up actually is with Kenna West. She's had like 31 number ones in the gospel, Southern gospel Christian world. Oh, wow. And so, she's going to come on and we're going to talk about that. I've been writing with her and kind of learning that market a little bit, where I'm the student, she's the, definitely the master. And I'm going to have her on, and, and that's going to be just for Freddie subscribers. But yeah, at this point, it's not always going to be this way, but at this point, it's like five bucks a month to subscribe to Freddie. It's, it's ridiculously cheap for getting to hang out with hit songwriters. And that's what, the part of the connect you with the pros we talk about. Right. That's it. That's part of it. Yeah, so, man. If you're in the room, maybe I'm going to go back and forth with them on. Because how many people did you have on that? On that one with Chris, we had like 60 something. Normally with Freddie, it's a, it's a small community right now. It's growing. We'll have like 25 people on. Oh. You could be in the room and ask Byron Hill or Jimmy Yeary or Kenna West or Chris Lindsay your questions and, and get a little bit of FaceTime and 
So that's just one of the things we do to connect people to the pros. So it's really cool. So, yeah, and we try to be multi-genre. There you go. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, that brings us to the end of another uh, Killer Climb podcast episode. Um, join the Climb community if you haven't done so yet on Facebook, man. There's lots of good stuff going on there. Subscribe to the podcast and all your... Um, you know, minisodes and all the main episodes on Tuesday come right automatically into your player. They're in order. You can consume them how you like. Leave a five-star rating and review. That lets other people know we're legit. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of share, you know, your thoughts and feelings on that. Yes. And then uh, finally, I mean, speaking of sharing, that's the best compliment you could give to us. If you got a another fellow songwriter, fellow musician, somebody in your band, somebody that's in your community that's, that could benefit from this, man, tell them, turn them on to it and let them know. All right? Mm-hmm. So uh, this podcast exists because we want you to win, so keep on climbing. And we'll see you at the top.